Put it on your pocket and show around as you wish. Something that is not struggling. Now, let's see. This is your presentation? Look, no. This is. Uh, this. This. Uh, uh, yep, the other reason. The one before. Yes. You know what to use? Yeah, yeah, okay. Or I will only know, use the, the arrow. As you wish. Yeah. You have the, the... And in case I want to highlight. Okay. okay. This way, he won't be able to miss you. Sergio, no, no. And the first one is uh, my colleague, Cor, Pierre, who is going to talk on how to share drone ability. Thank you. So it's very moving to be, to be here. And as many of you, we have the impression that Jean-Francois is, is with us. And I can uh, tell you how much we and I miss him. I was lucky enough to be a PhD student in the late 70s. Uh, great days for game theory and general equilibrium. So I have benefited since then from Jean-Francois' uh, help many times. OK, this is a talk which is a simple application of cooperative game. Uh, theory, so don't expect any new, new conceptual development. So the problem that uh, we are addressing, my colleague uh, Samuel Ferre and I, is the problem of sharing the damage that has been 
caused by several individuals. It's a difficult problem and uh, historically common law actually did not accept any apportionment. The victim had a claim against each tort feeser and tort feasers could not have a claim against the others. There has been long debates, there has been a uniform contribution among Tort Feasers Act in 1939, revised until 1955, that opened the possibility of appointment of apportionment, of divi division of the damage among the tort feasors. There is a restatement of torts, several versions, 1939-1999, that has started by providing general principle for solving this problem. So here we address that problem, how to apportion the damage caused by several tort feasors. These are litigation that are common in various settings, environmental law, accidental law, medical malpractice, and so on. So let's take an example. Well, we have a car driver, there is an accident, the pedestrian has his leg broken. The victim is brought to the hospital and there is a fault by the surgeon and uh, I'm sorry but the leg has to be amputated. So how to determine the compensation that the victim is ent clearly entitled to? Huh? Should, the, should the judge consider that the driver is liable for the entire damage? Or should each of them pay half or cover half of it? All that one is uh, one of them is more liable than the others, but then then to what extent? I mean, th that that is the simple question and difficult question that uh, uh, we 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 look at in this uh, framework. Most existing model indeed in law and economics put the focus on incentives, and this is in a non-cooperative setting. So there are many papers that deal with uh, in a non-cooperative setting with such a problem. Here instead we we focus on compensation and fairness from a cooperative point of view and so we model the apportionment problem as a cooperative game. So incentives is about ex ante causation. I mean it's really uh, create incentive for future behaviors while here we are in an exposed position. The thought has been caused. Okay. So we call a judgment the specification of uh, compensation that for each of the persons involved, the tort feasors, we specify how much uh, they have to, to contribute to the, uh, to the compensation to the victim. So there is clearly a minimum compensation. Tort feasors should pay at least the damage that they would have caused alone. And this is very important because here we start introducing the notion of potential damage. So this is the minimum. And the maximum is that each tort feeder should not pay more than their additional damage, the additional damage that they have caused. The additional damage is the difference between the total damage and the damage that would have resulted uh, without the participation of that individual. Okay. So these are two bounds, but we go further, and these bounds can be found actually. These these ideas are in the general principles. Yes, so oh, in, sorry. In, the, in your example, in, the, in your example, the the, uh, the driver has the pedestrian. Well, what are these two? What are these two numbers? Yeah, the minimum and the maximum. Yeah, what are they? Okay, the, the, the minimum is the leg broken. This is for the first. The, the, that's the minimum the driver should have to pay, clearly. Okay, and what's the maximum that he has to pay? Here, the driver, is the maximum is the total damage, actually. Okay, can you put that slide back? The, the one that defines the minimum. So, which, which is really the difference between the total damage and the damage that would have resulted from uh, if if 
that person had not been involved. We. So in other words, if the driver had not <coughs> hit the guy, then then nothing would have happened. Of course, in that case. Of course, this is the example with, is with two. It's more interesting when there are three, but I mean, we'll see. So we extend, actually, uh, we'll come back to that because we extend the argument to subsets of tort feasors. Could use already the word coalition, of course, but I mean, here in this, in this setting. So the contribution of each subset of tort feasors, there is a minimum on what a subset of tort feasors pays, and this is the potential, their potential damage. Right? The damage that they, they would have caused without the intervention of the others. And now you see, of course, appearing the characteristic function. And the contribution of any subset of tort feasors should not exceed the additional damage resulting from their participation. So we extend this lower bound and upper bound from individuals to subsets of uh, tort feasors. And any judgment that uh, satisfy these two conditions, we call them acceptable judgment. Hopefully it will become clear in an instant, if you don't mind. We distinguish two levels, because we assume a lot has already been done after the accident has occurred. So there is an objective level. Experts have asserted the role of each player, of each tort feasors, in order to determine the additional damage that each of them caused. Okay? And there is a subjective level. This is the judge that has to, be de to determine the degree of responsibility of each player. Okay. So, okay, in that case, of course, there is no. They are both really jointly responsible, and there is no way to. So uh, repeat then the, your example. Maybe so I didn't. Two people shooting at the same time, someone is uh, died. So both bullets. He's hit by both bullets. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, you know that they spend a lot of time in determining which bullet has killed the person. Huh? And if eventually they don't succeed, then, of course, uh, this will be typically, of course, they are really jointly responsible. And uh, the damage has occurred. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's a unanimity game. Do you agree with this? So typically, uh, you will divide it in two, because they are completely different. Yeah, but yes. Okay, we'll come back to that. Yeah. So, uh, because what we analyze, although in the paper we also consider the simultaneous case, case we analyze a sequential case. Okay, so we have. <laughs> I'm sure each time, each time I present the seminar, people have such an imagination about uh, something. <laughs> they kill my talk. <laughs> so please refrain yourself. After that, we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let's let's and let's vote. Another person down on the floor receives him on a sword. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I should tell what the result is. Okay, that's interesting. You will give me the reference. Okay, so we analyze indeed sequential situation that could be of that time. 
uh, involve a number n players. They, they act sequentially. And we, the sequence has been identified. And we follow, actually, the... Uh, uh, so we, we, we do not consider, at least in my talk, I don't consider the possibility of really what I call joint, as your example, joint causation. We have really something that is sequential. So we follow the natural ordering. We start with player one until player n. And we have one information. This is assumed to be known by on the sequence. We know what is the additional damage that each player is causing in the sequence. Okay? This is assumed to be known. It's not necessarily an easy data to, to, to agree upon, but we, we assume it is, it is given. So we have a damage vector from which we, could, we can compute cumulative damage, or, which is the cost. Uh, for each player, you are at a certain point in the sequence, so you add your damage to the preceding damage. Okay. So Cn is the total damage that has to be divided. So the natural uh, li game, which I, we call liability game, uh, the characteristic function, first of all, of course, in any uh, coalition in which player one is not present, doesn't cause any, cause any damage. Any, if you have a coalition that contains a complete string from 1 to i, and i plus 1 is not in the sequence, then we stop at ci, okay? This is the total cost, of course, the total damage that is to be divided. And in particular, if you remove player i from the grand coalition, you stop at ci minus 1. So c1, c2, ci minus 1. So just to be sure, a three-player three case. So we have player one. Where is it? Player one cause D1. And the coalition one, three, two is not present. So we stop at D1, which is C1, actually. One, two, they caused D1, D2. So that's C2. Two and three, one is not there. And the total cost is the sum of the uh, uh, three additional damage, C3. Okay. One, two, four, you stop. One, two, four, yes. Yes, exactly. So, of course, if you are familiar with airport games, you, you will see that there is a clear connection with airport games. So, a judgment is a vector that specifies a contribution by each player that covers the uh, total cost. So, I, I use this notation in the, in the slides to simplify the notation. The victim could be, have some responsibility at some point. Uh, we can come to that. So the core, yes, it doesn't come. This is our RN. So the core, this is the uh, definition for a TU game. Uh, it's an allocation of the value of the game, the worth of the grand coalition, and no coalition can improve upon. We know that these inequalities here, using this equality, this identity there, can be written with a complementary coalition so that clearly core allocation are acceptable judgment. And now you recognize the definition. V of S is the potential damage of coalition S. So uh, we have the lower bound. Each coalition should pay at least its potential damage but not more that it's additional damage, which is that the difference between the total cost and the cost that, uh, the damage that would have been caused without uh, the coalition. Okay. So core and uh, uh, acceptable judgment, this is synonymous. Uh, because of the sequential structure, the uh, uh, Many inequalities defining the core are redundant, so the core can be defined in this way. Uh, and you observed already that uh, no players pays for uh, damage that have, have been caused upstream. You only pay for the damage uh, upstream. You don't pay for damage that has been caused downstream. OK, we'll, uh, this is quite natural. So we observed that there are several particular allocations 
The first one, of course, is we observe that player one in any case pays at least D1. There is no way out. There is an allocation by which the first player pays everything. It's a core allocation. It's an acceptable judgment. And then there is this allocation, which many lawyers would say, but that's natural. You just ask each one to pay this additional damage, his or her additional damage. And indeed, the vector of damages is a core allocation. It's an acceptable judgment. Mm -hmm. So in, in, this is in terms, in individual terms. In particular, of course, the last player will never pay more than its additional damage. Okay. I suppose it's clear. So what, what, what is the next uh, concept that we would like to look at? It's, of course, the Chaplet value. So to define the Chaplet value, we start with player orderings. We define marginal contribution vectors. You know the parabola. Huh? Player one enters a room, receives his marginal contribution. Player two comes in, receives his marginal contribution. So to each ordering, we can associate an imputation, which uh, is uh, attached to that ordering. In the three-player case, there are four distinct vectors. There are always, of course, three, uh, six, but distinct, there are only four. These two we already have seen. And these two, I will say more about it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instant. So graphically, what we do have, uh, we have the triangle of imputation, which is player one, player two, player three, the lower bound for player one. So these are the imputations. And then I have only one additional uh, constraint def to define the core. So that this area here is the set of acceptable judgment. Okay. So we observe that actually the vertices of the core, the vertices of the core are the marginal contribution vectors. This is a characteristic of convex game. And indeed, liability games are convex. One way to prove it is very simple, is to show that liability games are duels of airport games. And airport games are known to be concave as cost games. So liability games are uh, convex. Okay. We use Chaplet 1971 result that the core of a convex game is the polyhedron whose vertices are the marginal contribution vectors, which is actually a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, convexity. And if we look at the marginal contribution vectors, actually it's easy to build them because these are vectors at which some players or subset of players can be exempted from uh, paying a contribution. And this must be done in a consistent way. You can be exempted, but at some point, here, for example, player three is exempted. So player two must support the total uh, damage d2 plus d3. So in general, let's, let's look at an example. In the six-player case, there is only one possibility in which player six, four, and two are exempted. Again, under that constraint that the player never pays for damage caused downstream. Okay. So a judge may decide to exempt some players, we know that the first player cannot be completely exempted. The Chaplet value, you know it, is the average marginal contribution vector. By convexity, it's a core. Uh, in general, it's a core uh, allocation. Therefore, for liability games, it defines an acceptable judgment. It's a neutral compromise. Tort feasors differ only in their contribution to the damage equal responsibility. The judge does not consider that there is any, because there could be reasons, of course, to uh, exempt partly or completely some tort feasors in case where a child has committed some uh, mistake. Maybe the judge can consider that the responsibility is not included, or that someone is really heavily responsible because of some misconduct, uh, and so on. Okay, so that's the subjective level uh, that is involved. Yes, Shwen. What is the idea of taking four 
random order for the Japanese language that was given order. You cannot sleep order. Well, I'm confused. Maybe I understand it. That indeed, yes, of course. Values are under order. Yes. Them by one order, given one order. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's right. The, 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 uh, uh, the formula for the Shapley value of using random order is only a formula. It's a, it's, it, uh, it is a proof of the theorem that there is a unique value satisfying uh, the axiom of the value. It's a formula. Don't take it. People have a tendency okay. to, to give these yeah. orders uh, some meaning, but think of it only as something satisfying the axiom. So you, if you think of this as a game, yeah, uh, which uh, has an existence in its own right, then it's Shapley value. Is it Shapley value? Yeah, the the fact that you have a, a random order is irrelevant. So but, one, but, one of the implications of the order is helping you in defining the characteristic function. So the story, the order is mm. set only for the characteristic function. But you're, you're right that in a sense it's a bit confusing because here I'm talking about orders. Taking the other well-known expression of the Shapley value, which is a weighted average of marginal contribution, would of course not meet this, R, this problem. It is. It will be like that, yes. So the whole point of the exercise is you're trying to allocate damage. And you have to think of what would have happened if something else, if the order would be different, yeah. if some, some one of them would not have been there. You, you have to do, you have to think of alternative scenarios. That's the whole point. Because in that scenario, you can just say, the first one is this, second is this, third is this, and you go home. But, uh, let let me proceed. So, maybe like an experiment. What would have happened? So liability games are dual support games, and there is a proposition that uh, says that the value of a game and its dual actually coincide. So uh, there is uh, an another way, of course, is to, to, to observe that liability game can be decomposed as a sum of elementary unanimity games of that form. So here I can decompose the uh, Unanim unanimity, uh, the, the liability games as a sum of unanimity games with respect to this coalition, 1 to i. Using symmetry and null player, we know that what is the Shapley value of a unanimity games, so that we get this very simple formula, which is nothing else than the airport uh, <laughs> formula. Huh? which is the natural, natural uh, way. Huh? So you divide the last damage among all players and then the uh, uh, preceding uh, uh, in damage among the n minus one players until you get to d1. So that's a natural, uh, 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 a natural division in case there is no reason to differentiate the players in terms of degree of responsibility. So location of the Shapley value somewhere there in the core because these two vectors count twice in the computation of the Shapley value. So now how to account for asymmetries? Shapley's already in 1953 introduced the idea of weights that led, has led to the notion of weighted value and what these weights represent depend of course on the context. There are a few examples. But not many applications I know of uh, weighted Shapley value. So here, a judge may assign weights to tort feasors. And uh, that can go as far as ex exempting some participant, of course, of uh, contributing. So just to recall, we have a vector of weights. The weighted Chaplet value is just the average marginal contribution vectors that is computed 15 minutes, thank you, which is computed uh, with respect to the probability distribution induced by W on the set of players' orderings, 
what we observed is that this probability distribution, if, that, if, if it is normalized, if I normalize the weights, WI is a probability that player I is last in a permutation. Okay. Equal weights, this is a symmetric Shapley value. And you can generate a set of all weighted values by considering limits for some but not all weights tending to zero. Okay. The, if I look at the weighted Shapley value of T unanimity games, this is uh, what we, we obtain. And uh, using additivity and the decomposition, uh, the Shapley value with weight W of reliability games is very, of course, similar to uh, its uh, symmetric part. So what you get is, of course, that each time you weight the additional damage by the relative probabilities that are there. Okay. We know from uh, Munderer, Samet, Chaplet that the core is a subset of the set of weighted Chaplet value. And uh, we know that the core so that the core is a subset of the set of weighted value. And the Weber set, which is the convex hull of the marginal contribution vectors, is a superset of the set of weighted Shapley value. In con for convex games, therefore, the core and the set of weighted values are identical. So that means that weighted values are core allocation and that weights can be associated to core allocation. Applied to liability games, it means that weighted values are acceptable judgments, and vice versa, that acceptable judgments reveal weights. Okay? So, for instance, this is, I've not, never seen this being used in any way in the literature, by the way, it's just to take the simple average of core vertices for convex games which, by the way, give very strange result uh, when you apply it to bankruptcy game. And, uh, by the way, the, uh, the figures that are in the Talmud, if you compute the average of the marginal contribution vectors, gives exactly the same result. But, if you apply it to other, you obtain uh, strange behavior of this average, where some people receive, that have larger claims, receive less. But it, in fact, it turns out that the, uh, the figures of the Talmud, but just, just a parenthesis, I address myself to Bob, Bob about that, but, uh, that apply to the figures that are in the Talmud, the average of marginal contribution vectors reproduce exactly the, the figures in the Talmud. For, so here, the weights that are revealed are well defined, one-fourth, one-fourth, one-half. And actually what is strange is that it does not depend on the number of players in the sense that the, second, the last player pays always half of its, his or her additional damage, while the other pay 1 divided by 2 and minus 1. So the same weight for the all other players, which has no special meaning, of course. The allocation that, of course, imposed to the first player, the initiator, to pay the full cost correspond to weight, normalized weight, where it's zero for everybody except for that, uh, that player. And what about the allocation that gives, uh, ask each player to pay uh, the ad exactly the additional damage? It corresponds to a limit, which is quite strange because it's a limit, and this is a mistake, sorry. Uh, it should be zero is the last one, so I have to correct this. This is one for the last one and zero for all the others. It, the idea is that the last one is more responsible, player n is more responsible than player n minus 1, which is more responsible, and therefore the last to be most more responsible is the player, player 1, actually. So this, is, this allocation uh, corresponds to a particular uh, evaluation or by the judge. So what we have shown is that the core uh, defines acceptable Shedman, Shapley value. It's a particular one, the weights. So I will not repeat that. So this is what we have seen. And the symmetric, just last slide, the symmetric Shapley value stands as a particular and attractive rule because it's, uh, at least when there is no reason to differentiate the players by on what they have committed in terms of damage. And uh, I rely on Young, 1985, 
uh, axiomatization of the Shapley value, which use, of course, symmetry. There is no doubt about that, and this can be found uh, in, in, in all uh, uh, discussion on torqued uh, uh, allocation. Equal treatment of equal symmetry, so uh, players that have contributed equally to potential damage uh, should contribute equal amounts. And the second is marginalism. There is clearly a allusion to this, is that what a player pays depends exclusively on his or her contribution to potential damage independently of the way uh, the other contribute to damage, which is, of course, a strong axiom, which is actually very close to additivity. Of course, this we know. Okay. I have considered the pure sequential game. Now, if all players act simultaneously, which means that really jointly, there is no way to differentiate them, then we are facing a unanimity game, and using the weights, we get, of course, this uh, allocation, or in the, uh, in the symmetric case, of course, would be 1 over nc. In the paper, I consider, uh, we consider the possibility that along the sequence, there may be a group of players that act jointly, maybe at the beginning, maybe in the middle. That's it. Thank you. Now, this I have not done. This is something that should be done. Uh, you're right. That means to, to have a, an axiomatization of the Shapley value on liability game that will be the same as for airport games. I have, I have not checked it. Is it possible to have a game in which you can apply symmetry? I don't think so. You could have, no, you could have symmetry games there. In the unanimity. In the liability game. Okay. Yeah, if a player... I think that it's impossible to apply symmetry. I have not excluded... I have not... Yes, no, you're right. But I mean, in the sequential case, I have not excluded an additional damage at some point in the sequence to be zero. You can uh, be there, cause no additional damage, but because you're there, it continues. So in that case, the two successive pairs are identical. But uh, I, I don't know about... Uh, So, I, I have assumed that the, there, is, there has been a preliminary <laughs> cleaning of the... No, of course, no, I mean, if you are there, many, many persons are responsible for you being there, so, <laughs> so, so we, we, we hope that the judge is uh, clever enough to, of course, retain the group of people that have really contributed to the damage. I mean, here, uh, <laughs> even if that, per that person, has, in your example, has caused no additional damage and could be asked to contribute. But clearly, a judge will, uh, yes? First, it seems critical, but chronological order is very important. Yes. Yes, that's why we need to clarify when the first publication was published, 71 or 72. <laughs> and second, could it be applied for a war game? You consider this as a damage? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. But, but maybe a war as well. Because could it be applied for a war game? Not for the ability game, but for a war. For example, hockey game, who gave? Pass to who? And finally, he wants more optimistic examples. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I agree, yes. 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 Yes.
mm -hmm. or on the quick order if you allow mm -hmm. all, so, several new actors to attend. Mm -hmm. But I don't see why there is a problem considering a partial order. For example, as an example, you can see that just some person suffered first from one piece, took out keys of his car, and then from another key, who took his wallet out, or his cell phone out. And then, because he had neither keys of the car nor cell phone, something terrible happened. And these two, uh, thieves, uh, they independent of each other, right? And so, oh, okay. this is a partial order of the, of, the, of the causation. And there are, I remember that there are clear generalizations of shared value to the games with games of graphs. Mm -hmm. When you have yes, a partial order, some, and, yeah. uh, I think this uh, theory can be already generalized to some more general setting of causation, which I believe is far more realistic. And this would deal with the problem with uh, someone shooting at the point person. No, no, you're right. We allude to that in the in the paper, but uh, we have not uh, uh, digged into that. Thank you. Did you have a uh, no. no more questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, this one. Is this on? It's working. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank uh, CORE and the Center for Rationality for organizing this uh, conference, or more properly, the Meltens Festival. Um, it's uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, rather than talk about completed papers that uh, don't have much to do with Mertens's work, I thought I'd present something that's very rough and has something to do with uh, two things that Mertens was interested in: stability and repeated games. Um, this is joint with Aldo Aristichini and Bob Wilson, and uh, we've been working on this off and on for a while now. More off than on, but uh, I'll just present uh, what we know and what we think is true. Um, okay, so as everybody well knows, the Fock theorem, the classical re result for repeated games, says that uh, anything that's individually rational and feasible can be got as the equilibrium payoff or even subgame perfect equilibrium payoff. Uh, in a repeated game, uh, with discounting, without discounting. And in particular, one implication of this is that uh, Pareto optimality is not inconsistent with strategic behavior, that you could get constrained Pareto optimal, that is, given the constraints of the Fock theorem set. You could get the Pareto frontier as equilibrium solutions. Um, that's, that's a very well-known implication, um, certainly going back to uh, work on oligopoly uh, in the 70s. Um, but another implication is that we have this huge set of equilibria, too many equilibria. And so it seems to lack a lot of predictive power. Um, so the question now is, can we use techniques from refinement to try to say something about, or try to whittle down the set, try to, to get a much smaller set uh, using some systematic theory. Okay? And in particular, the question we're interested in is um, what kinds of refinements or selection criteria could be used to get to spirit optimal outcomes? Okay. So, so why is this even a, why isn't this a non-starter? Why doesn't this look hopeless? There's actually a lot of work in the literature that suggests that this is uh, this has some uh, chance. So I'm going to give you an example by Alman, uh, Caves and Kurtz. This is from 
1976. It's not an example that many people seem to know. Um, it's the Prisoner's Dilemma game. So uh, it's a standard Prisoner's Dilemma game with cooperating defect. Um, what I want to do is to, or what they do is say, well, let's suppose that we restrict players to use strategies of bounded recall one. Okay, so you can only use strategies that are contingent, that just depend on what your opponent did in the previous period. Okay. Ah, we get this game. And I use limit of means. Okay. So we get an 8 by 8 game because you, get, you have to choose what to do to begin the game. And then as a function of what your opponent did, you have to choose a strategy. So you get an 8 by 8 game. If you do iterative elimination of dominated strategies, you get the tit for tat strategy is the only one surviving. Okay. So if you just look at this game, Simple iterative elimination predicts the cooperative outcome as the only rational solution. Okay, so. um, that's the tit-for-tat strategy, okay? But one thing to note here is it's not, it's not that the tit-for-tat strategy dominates every other strategy. That's not what's happening. You really do need two steps of elimination. First, the strategy where you defect initially and then you defect when the other guy cooperates and cooperate when the other guy defects uh, eliminates the strategy where the other guy, where you do the exact opposite in the first stage. Okay? So you need this initial round of elimination, and then uh, the tit for tat strategy eliminates everything. Okay. Um, this is with limit of means, uh, and and your your uh, your, a your action in any period can depend only on what your opponent did the previous period. But the result is somewhat robust. First of all, obviously, as you would, as you would uh, suspect, it's also true of, with sufficiently high discount because you just have cycles here. Uh, but it's also true if you make the recall <coughs> depend on both your strategies. If you increase recall to 2, 3, or 4, or use automata of size 2, 3, or 4. Okay. However, it's, what is not true is that you can apply iterative elimination. You can't apply iterative elimination. So it's, once you increase the memory size, uh, you don't get this uh, clean result uh, that uh, AC and K got. It it's a good question. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. We don't know how to do it computationally. So this is a computational experience. This is pretty large. <laughs> computationally. Um, but the result holds in the sense that this is the only stable outcome. The cooperation is the only stable outcome in this, in this, for such small memories. It's not necessarily the tit for, I mean, it's, it's, so the, it's, in the stable component, you have many stable components. It's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's not necessarily tit for tat. There is, uh, you would think that tit for tat is somehow a focal uh, strategy, if I could use the phrase, but it's not. Uh, it's not completely clear. Okay. Um, that's a lot. Many people seem to know this, uh, as I was telling uh, Bob uh, a while back, but it is mentioned in Almansoran's paper. Uh, which is my next example. It's also, I think, in uh, Neyman's paper on automata and repeated, yeah, infinitely repeated games. I think these are the only two places where I've seen these mentions. So. But it's a very interesting result. Okay, but that's not all. I think there are, there are other things in the literature that suggest that something like this is maybe true. Okay, so let me begin with the result by Alman and Soran in 1989. Uh, they show that if you take a common interest game, it's slightly more general, but I don't want to. Uh, I'm going to sacrifice precision to get the idea across. Supposing we have a common interest game, uh, the repeated game, and uh, we ask. And so we have, we have a small possibility that the players' uh, strategies are perturbed, and they end up playing strategies with bounded recall. They show this result that if you look at pure strategy equilibria of these perturbed games and go to the limit, um, 
the only equilibria that could possibly survive are the common uh, are the ones that choose the Pareto optimal outcome. Okay, and more than that, there exists such equilibria. So it's not a state; it's not a vacuous statement. There are equilibria of this form, and and the only equilibria of this uh, only pure strategy equilibria will give you Pareto optimal. Okay. Um, so, so they get they get pure optimality. Of course, you need to restrict. There are two two important restrictions here. One is you need to restrict yourself to pure strategies, pure strategy equilibria in these the third games. And the other thing is that they need uh, bounded recall and uh, this discussion of why you don't you can't use bounded uh, you can't uh, use uh, automata. Okay. So you have these uh, restrictions, main restrictions. Um, there's also a result by Feudenberg and Maskin around the same time uh, that shows that if you if you uh, analyze this problem of prisoner's dilemma um, using uh, evolutionary gain theory, um, once again, and so now you restrict yourself to symmetric equilibria. Once again, you you get basically the cooperative outcome. So once you restrict yourself to symmetric equilibria, we're on the diagonal. Of the payoff space, uh, there is a unique uh, Pareto optimal point on the diagonal, and the, that's the cooperative outcome. Get the same result. Uh, there, there are some conditions. Uh, they look at automata, and and there is a possibility of making mistakes in every period, and so on. So, but this is the basic message of the paper. And, and recently, I think they have uh, uh, they have extended uh, this result uh, by relaxing some of the assumptions. Um, I don't know exactly the, uh, the formal statement of the new result, but there is some extension recently as well. Um, similar to Oman's result is a result by Demekelis, uh, which 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 uses an evolutionary viewpoint to to get the result that's similar to Oman's one. Basically, you get the Pareto optimal outcome if you apply some notion of evolutionary evolutionarily stable sets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one 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 thing is that if you if when you deviate from play, um, there is a there's somehow an obvious focal point of uh, of the Pareto optimal outcome. So basically, one of the ideas here is to use like a the handshake. Argument going back to Arthur Robson, so you, you basically, yeah, so so that that works well in the common interest game, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't do anything in the prisoner's dilemma, for instance. So, um, okay. Uh, Martin Osborn and Eric Van Damme have also studied this uh, uh, Idea of using refinements, but they looked at finitely repeated games, and in particular things like battle of sexes. We we know that uh, for prisoner's dilemma, finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, you can't get anything. This is the only Nash uh, uh, outcome, so we we can't get anything. But for battle of sexes in games like that, you can get somewhere. Uh, you can show that you couldn't repeat the same pure strategy equilibrium. That's better for one of the players. You couldn't repeat the same thing twice. So on. and and one of the one of the one of the one of the differences between the battle of sexes and and, and say prison dilemma and so on is in some of these games I think the finitely repeated game the asymptotic properties are are better so there are results by Benoit and Krishna about uh, folk theorems for um, finitely repeated games so it could have something to do with that I'll say something about this later. Okay, so um, so this is this is to this is to uh, basically uh, give you sort of evidence from the literature that this has been sort of done. Um, yes, yes. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, that that belongs here as well. That's fine. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> What we wanted to do was to uh, was to uh, was to was to see if there was any uh, if if this is just coincidence or if there is any any merit uh, any anything substantial that links all these results uh, um, that we could learn from. 
And to do that, we wanted to try to systematically develop some notion of refinements for repeated gains. Uh, and the obvious one to fix uh, uh, the sites on is stability, because it's been so successful, as Bob Almond mentioned early on. So that's what we intend to do. Um, so we looked at various ways of trying to attack this problem. So this, this uh, presentation is a catalog of things that don't work. And uh, something that, that seems to have the promise of, of being able to do something. Okay. And I'll try to illustrate that by using, by using a, um, a version of Prisoner's Dilemma, which is sort of Stackelberg, and, uh, and, and getting some refinement there. Okay, but it's very it's a very limited uh, result. Uh, but, uh, anyway, you'll see. Okay, um, so I, I'll just briefly talk about the model. I, I'm not going to do many many things formally, though some of this can be formalized. Um, for lack of time, I'm just going to uh, briefly tell you a little bit about. Uh, about the model and then talk a little bit about finite games because we want to know how to extend from finite games to repeated games these ideas. And uh, what we thought were there were a couple of different approaches that can be directly applied to the infinite game. And uh, th these, are, these are two things that don't work, at least for us, they don't. And then I'm just going to talk about a possible way to do this that may work. Okay, I'm just talk And then this, what I call the reciprocity game is really the Stackelberg version of the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, um, I'm just going to uh, go very quickly now. Uh, so there is a stage game, finite number of players, finite number of actions, and the payoffs in the stage game. We're going to consider repeated games. Time is indexed by 0, 1, and so on. H superscript C is the set of all T period histories. And H is the union of all histories of all periods. And H infinity is going to be the set of all plays. H zero equals. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's when all P equals zero. <laughs> this may not be the only typo in the. <laughs> uh, uh, here is another one. This should be T plus one. Anyway, um, so a pure strategy. Specifies for it. Yeah, but <laughs> true. But, I, but the, it's a typo because I intended to write t plus one. My hand trembled. Uh, so for every history, you want to, you need to choose an action. Uh, so SN is a set of pure strategies. I want to look at mixed strategies. I want to deal with uh, mixed strategies because. Uh, for, refined, uh, for stability, you typically look at mixed strategies, not behavioral strategies. So sigma n is a set of mixed strategies. Then you have the discounted payoff, the undiscounted payoff. Uh, I'm just writing limit. It's not that it exists everywhere. But for everything that I'm going to do, this is the only thing that matters, as usual. So I'll just leave it be. And then g delta is the discounted game. Delta equals 1 is the undiscounted. Uh, in, in refinements, we typically look at strategies, not payoffs. And in repeated games, we look at payoffs. We, don't, you know, we rarely describe things in terms of strategies. So here I'm going to look at just equilibrium payoffs for the time being, uh, be more consistent with repeated games. V delta is the set of equilibrium payoffs for the delta game. OK. Um, so what I want to do is to try to try to define some notion of stability for this game. Uh, to do that, I want to go back to finite games and see what we know from finite games. Okay, so this is a very quick, uh, very quick and imprecise uh, reminder on what, uh, what happens in finite games. Okay, so various notions of stability um, ask for robustness of equilibria with respect to perturbations. Okay. Which means for every epsilon, there is a delta such that if you're within delta in the perturbation space, 
then you're within epsilon of the solution you want, okay? And uh, these are set-valued solutions, so you're within epsilon of the set of solutions, okay? So all these definitions of stability, they differ only in the notion of what counts as a perturbation. What is the space of perturbations we're dealing with? And once we have that space and have a notion of a distance there, the rest is somehow uh, standard. Okay. So we could think of the space of perturbations as being the space of all perturbations of payoffs. So if I have a matrix game, if I have a two by two matrix game, then I could perturb each of the entries for the players. So my space of perturbations is just the space of all two by two games. Okay, and if you look at that, then you get this notion of essential equilibria. Okay, that's, that's, that's a concept that goes back to the 60s. Now, so. These are equilibria that are robust with respect to payoff perturbations. Now, you, if you impose, if you impose an addition that, that the set be invariant under the operation of adding duplicate strategies, which means if I have a mixed strategy in the original game, and I now explicitly add it as a pure strategy. So in my original two by two game, I could mix half top, half bottom. And now I add a third strategy, which, is, which has the exact meaning of half top and half bottom, not just to the player mixing, but also for the opponent. That's what you call a duplicate strategy. And if you ask that the solution not vary if you add duplicate strategies, invariance in the appropriate sense. Because these are in different spaces, <coughs> but you can go from one to the other. If you add invariance, you get something called hyperstability. Okay. And it turns out that hyperstability is basically uh, equivalent to choosing components of Nash that have a non zero fixed point index. So you can define for each component of Nash, and this is an important point because I'm going to try to do this in the infinite game. For each component of Nash, we can define a fixed point index, which is just a, uh, which is, comes from fixed point theory. An index just being a count, algebraic count, of the number of fixed points close by if you perturb the fixed point problem. Okay? So to say that you have a non-zero index is to say that every close by fixed point has a solution close by. Okay? Hyperstability is basically equivalent to the same value. Okay, so, so this is one notion that we could potentially use. So. The other notion goes back to Kohlberg and Mertens, who look at a subset of the space of payoff perturbations. So if I fix delta and I fix a mixed strategy, if you want to play sigma, you will only end up playing that with probability one minus delta. And with probability, F, uh, oops, <laughs> with probability delta, you, this is delta. With probability delta, you end up playing uh, tau. That's, a, that's another perturbation. This actually can be viewed as a very special case of payoff perturbations. Because you can say the payoff from playing sigma is the payoff from playing this. Rather than restrict the strategy set, you can change the payoffs. It's equivalent. Okay. Now that's Kohlberg Mertens, so if you use that notion. Then Mertens went on to strengthen this. So I'm not going to go into this, but there's a strengthening of this that he uses. Okay, so these are the two ideas I'm going to focus on, just, uh, just to show you uh, how things look in, in the repeated game. So we, I'm going to look in terms of fixed point index theory, and I'm going to try to look in terms of strategy perturbations directly in the infinite game. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to, this notion of hyperstability, I'm going to try to use index theory. Um, So now I want to work with discounted games. I don't want to look at delta equals one because I want to, I want to look at the topological aspects of the problem. Okay. So, so, the mixed, so the mixed strategy set is a nice uh, compact convex set. Uh, it's, uh, it's even metrizable. And if you assume discounting, the payoffs are continuous. So this is why I want to look at discounting. The payoffs are continuous. The best response correspondence is well behaved. And so we can use fixed point theory. In particular, we can look at uh, notions of fixed point index and so on. And say, so you can ask the question, can we view this problem from the, from, from the viewpoint of index or fixed point theory? 
but what if we try to look at perturbations of the best of work correspondence? This is corresponds in some sense to hyperstability. Well, actually, you don't get anything. <laughs> so uh, the way the way the way it's done. The way, the way it's done uh, in applying fixed point theory is, well, we know how to do it when you have a finite dimensional space. Okay. So we know how to do fixed point uh, index theory when you have a finite dimensional space, but now you have an infinite dimensional space. How do you do it? Um, you do it by approximation using finite dimensions. Okay. So what you say is, look, I want you, the best reply correspondence is on this bigger space. But I want to try to take something that's finite dimensional and approximate everything using the finite dimensional set. Okay? So for instance, if I have a, given my opponent's strategy, I want to best respond using something in the infinite game, I'm going to take a, something that's close to it, but in this finite dimensional set, and use this as my sort of best reply correspondence. Okay? That's the perturbation. And in fact, you can do this, okay? You can do this quite uh, explicitly. You fix epsilon greater than zero, we can find the subset of mixed strategies. A finite, you can find a finite subset of mixed strategies, and so you take a convex hull of that, those things. And you can find a map that basically approximates this, okay? So the new map maps from all strategies in the original game to this finite dimensional subset. And it's an approximation of the best reply correspondence in the sense that the graph of the best reply correspondence is within epsilon of the graph. The graph of the new best reply correspondence is within epsilon of the graph of the best reply correspondence of the original game. Okay, so it's really a finite approximation of the original problem. Okay, and really shouldn't matter what sequences you choose typically and that those things can be shown I'm, I'm not I don't want to bore you with many of these details but what does it yield okay the the very the very tractability that uh, the discounted game gives you also causes a limitation because after uh, a million periods really nothing matters okay so for instance these things you know these approximations can be things like uh, Take a large time horizon, allow for any, you know, look at the basically the T period game up to that point, and then you just uh, fix some action beyond that point. Okay, just fix some arbitrary action beyond that point, and then you very well approximate the original problem. Okay, now you, now you see this is a pretty hopeless thing because you can look at the prisoner's dilemma, and uh, you say, well, I can do anything up to period T, but beyond that point, I have to just basically do the same thing. This is like a T period problem. And we know that we are just going to get defection forever. Okay. And in fact, you can use this to approximate any equilibrium. Okay, so trying to uh, approximate the best of black correspondence is a bit of a problem. Though, though the problem stems from the fact that uh, the approximations are not uniform in delta in some sense. Okay. How, how good these approximations are, they depend very finely on delta. So to, to borrow a term from Neyman and uh, Mertens and Neyman, we would need some kind of uniform approximation to, to get away from this problem. And, and, and maybe that's part of what we're doing, um, I think. <laughs> It's not, it's not, this is, so this is not something that's, uh, <coughs> it's not something that's proved very useful for us. Um, okay, so that's, that's trying to think in terms of hyperstability. Um, so now we can try to do this in terms of <laughs> perturbing the given repeated game towards some fixed strategy, okay? Uh, this has the flavor of Bayesian games that Francois was talking about, and some reputation games, in fact. Um, and, and so what happens here? So we, we, just, we just look at uh, uh, 
uh, so we're going to just look for simplicity we're going to look at the prisoner's dilemma okay so we look at prisoner's dilemma just to show you what's going on we look at prisoner's dilemma and say put up the game towards the tit for tat strategy and now I'm going to switch focus and look at the limit of means uh, I'm just going to use the limit of means criterion just to make the argument uh, easier to follow. Uh, if you perturb one player, it, you can show existence, I think, but with two players, it's not. You can't show existence in general. So, but anyway, I, well, but that my point is to actually just to do some computations and, and directly show you equilibria rather than think about existence problems here and see what kinds of problems already emerge. Uh, so tit for tat perturbation, one player is perturbed towards tit for tat. We're looking at limit of means. And I'm I'm going to just to just to fix just to fix ideas uh, like in Francois's talk, I'm just going to think about one round of communication. Uh, look, look at equilibria that have the feature that there is one round of communication and then uh, no communication beyond that. What does that mean? That means in the first period the rational type of player one, I mean, the, the, the type, the tit for type, I'm just going to, that's just an automaton, but the rational type or the strategic type could possibly in the first period communicate to player two that he's rational or not. And then beyond that, there is no further revelation. Okay? I just want to focus on equilibrium of this type. There is, of course, the fully revealing equilibrium. No, I'm sorry. I should say they communicate using the strategy. The tit for tat type begins by playing cooperate. Thanks for asking the question. The tit for tat type begins by cooperating and then does exactly what the other, other player did in the previous round. So player one can communicate to player two in the first round by defecting. That's what I mean by communication. No discounting. I have an infinite horizon. And no discounting. No discounting. But this is a this is not a strategic type. The the the, the this 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 is this is not a this this tit for tat is. You get you get the equilibrium where. Um, you get the cooperative outcome because you know if I go defect, I yeah. For simplicity, let's look at a payoff vector of the kind where the playoffs are symmetric. Okay. It's just a strategy thing, right? So it's yeah. just. Yeah. Okay. You know, in the first round, so let, you know, I want. How do I get some common payoff vector less than the cooperative outcome? In the first round, player one plays defection with some probability. Okay. Following defection, because there's full revelation, we know how to get this payoff. But if player one cooperates, there is no revelation from then on. Player two plays the strategy that against tit for tat yields exactly this number. If he deviates, the rational player is going to punish him by deviating forever. If the probability of the rational type is high enough, you can sustain this as an equilibrium player. Okay. Uh, oh, you get basically the Fock theorem thing. In fact, so second reference to Corin today. The game seems to have the flavor of the game studied by Corin and Shalev. One type is an automaton. Uh, is not uh, is not really gaming this thing. Then you can construct the possible games so that uh, the strategy of the automaton you have some flexibility. Not such thing the, the games uh, that are possible in current or shadow, so that the automaton uh, is the only possible strategy of in the constraint. No, no, this, this epsilon type of tit for tat is fixed at the beginning. Yes. In any case, you can construct the auxiliary game so that this is the only. And then you have, if you do that, you have a 
have a full connection. What I'm saying is that you can make a full connection with the foreign shell. Okay. Um, so we looked at the current shell of results and we said, okay, we must get this thing. Uh, and uh, but then we, we we had all these other possibilities and so. Uh, maybe this is all well known, but what we didn't really know much of this, so we should probably have a chat later on. But um, anyway, all I'm trying to say is that just looking at perturbations in the infinite uh, horizon game is not doing much. You, you still get the entire folk theory set. <coughs> so I think we need to go back. So that, these are the things we learned. Just looking directly at the infinite horizon game and just technically circumventing the infinite infiniteness of the problem is not working. However, we have this startling example and other work, and there's I think they're suggesting something. They're all they all have to do with automata and things like that. So there's some finiteness that's imposed, but there must be some discipline in the way these strategies are chosen. At any point in time, looking forward, there is some this is this has the force of disciplining your beliefs about what's happening. So we just want to look at bounded recall or bounded uh, or, or, finite, or finite automata and study those games. Okay. So an obvious thing, so let's just look at two-player games. An obvious thing to do is to just look at automata. Okay. So then the question is, what kinds of automata? We're going to fix the size of the automata for each player. Um, in principle, we can look at what we're going to call normal form automata. So these are just deterministic deterministic transitions and deterministic actions. But you could also have randomized actions. You could also have randomized transitions. Let me not go there for the time being. Let me just say that the transitions are deterministic, but the actions are random. I'm going to call them the behavioral form. Uh, okay, but they all, you know, so they, they, both, they both induce finite games. And they all have uh, good properties. The behavioral form is especially nice because if you know that your opponent is using a behavioral strategy of size kn, then you have a best response of size kn. Uh, just use his states as your states for the automaton, and then, and then you can do this. It's not true when your opponent is mixing over pure automaton. You can't, you can't do this. Uh, on the other hand, you know, so on the other hand, the pure automata, you got linearity of payoffs. Uh, which you don't have for behavioral forms, so they all seem to have one, one advantage or the other. However, both of them have the following problem: it's impossible to think about these strategies in the infinite game without losing perfect recall. Uh, you just—if uh, I think of choosing an automaton, I just choose it once and for all in the beginning. I have no—I cannot revise my strategy. Uh, I, the, re the representation is just. Everything is automated, right? So there's no way to think about this dynamically. It's not, it's not possible to think about the dynamic representation of an automaton. And yet, for refinements, especially things like stability, a lot of the power comes from the counterfactual reasoning you do off the equilibrium part. If, ma if, the <coughs> if a player deviates from equilibrium play, what am I going to infer about what he's doing? This reasoning is not possible uh, if you don't have perfect recall. In fact, it's even worse, as I'll show you. We have a game. You could start with a stage game that's perfect information, and you convert it to a game with you know you don't have perfect recall. Okay, so that's that doesn't seem like a nice thing. So what we want to do is to try to get the flavor of automata and yet be able to have perfect recall. And in fact, if you have a game with perfect information, produce a game that has perfect information. Okay. Uh, which then leads us to our definition. Okay, that's the that's a technical definition. I think you can ignore this and maybe just listen to what I have to say because it's simpler in words. Um, so we have a two-player game, and supposing each player has a tom can use an automata of size 10. What we want to do is to look at all pairs of automata for the two players, one for each player, and look at the path of play induced by each such pair. 
and so take all these uh, parts, and then we prune the tree so no other part exists. Okay, and that's what we are talking about in terms of selections here. The definition of a selection is much more general. A selection is basically a finite selection of place from the tree. Okay, it just needs to satisfy an additional property that it respects the information structure of the original game. So if I have a simultaneous move game, stage game, uh, in each stage that information structure should be respected. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's a condition, that's a technical condition. But basically all it says is you look at finite plays of the game, of the infinite game, and that's what counts as a selection. And in particular, we're looking at selection generated by automata of given size or bounded recall of given length and so on. That's what this is definition is saying. Okay. So it's a finite game. I want to stress here that it's not it's not a finite stage game. So I'm not going up to T periods and then stopping. The play continues forever, but after some point, no player has any non-trivial move to make at any point in time. Okay? And by looking at things like automata, I get that delta equals 1 is a point of continuity of this game. So when I want to, I want to look, I want, I want to have delta equals one be a point of continuity of the analysis, and things like automata seem to do this properly. Okay. Um, in general, I guess any time you have a, you have a. Any time you have the discounted average converging, that would be good enough. But there is the, the strategic considerations seem different. Okay, so I want to take a finite selection, which is this pruned finitely prune tree obtained from the original game, it defines a finite game and I can now look at its equilibria. Okay? So I want to think about approximations of these things. So basically the prune tree is getting denser as the approximation gets finer until I get the whole thing. How stuff on plays or something like that. But I also want to replicate the Fock theorem set as I increase my gain. Okay, so I want to be, so I want to, I want, this is, this is crucial here because I want to, I want to look at a finite selection where the equilibrium payoffs are approximately the Fock theorem set. And from this set, I would like to be able to make a selection. So that's the thing we want to study. Uh, and so we want, we want to, everything would depend on the approximating sequence. And this says, a subset of payoffs is stable. I'm just focusing on payoffs. We should probably talk about strategies. But a subset is stable if there is an approximating sequence of games and then a corresponding sequence of stable sets whose payoffs converge to this. Okay. So we believe that this is the formulation that we sort of need. And we have some experience suggesting that this is what's going on. There's something about selections induced by automata that seem to work well, and this goes back to this notion of sort of uniform approximation of best plug correspondence I told you about. Uh, it's, it seems to be a defining property of, of selections induced by automata. <laughs> okay, I'll just end with a, with a simple example here. This is the Stackelberg version of uh, Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, B is greater than C. Okay, I'll just call this a reciprocity game. It can be viewed like a lender borrower game. I lend today, I, I lend today, you borrow and then you repay me tomorrow, something like that. Or mutual gift giving. This is Pareto optimal, but this is what's going to happen. B is greater than C, this is Pareto optimal, but this is what's going to happen. Um, if the ratio is, of B to C is generic, then finite selections have a unique subgame perfect equilibrium. And this is not defect forever. Okay. Uh, this, this, if, I, if I take a finite selection of this, if I repeat this finitely many times, of course you get this. But if I take a finite selection, depending on the selection, of course, but if I take selections induced by automata, you don't get this. It's a unique subgame perfect equilibrium. 
okay, if the ratio of the ratio of complexities goes to zero, it's stronger than that. Uh, you get a result that uh, Dov and uh, Gilboa got, which is which they call the twenty of the week. Basically, the player whose complexity is limited gets his be gets his best possible payoff. <coughs> okay. Now, if the ratio is is the same, and if the equilibrium is symmetric, we get the cooperative outcome. I would think, but it's, it's, we're not sure how to prove that this is symmetric. And it seems as the ratio of this goes from zero to infinity, we somehow seem to trace better optimal paths. At least uh, this ratio has to go to zero sufficiently fast, you know. So for small memories, even if it's asymmetric, it doesn't matter too much. Yeah. You mean the KT is much larger than K1? So K1 is little of KT. One is long memory and yeah. Basically, you, you can, uh, basically the problem is that player two can separate player one from the strategy that gives him the best payoff because he has such a long memory. And, uh, and you separate and you best respond separately. And uh, so player one who's committed has the best payoff action. It's kind of, uh, it's very, Seems counterintuitive until you think about it, and then and then you see that this is. Uh, 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 so I, I think uh, I think I'm out of time. So uh, I think I will just uh, stop here. Yeah, questions. Yeah. What is four? I, I, yeah. Which uh, you mean one of the guys? I want to. I want to look at the. Uh, I want to. In the folk theorem said, I want to look at the Pareto frontier. Yeah. Okay. The Pareto frontier. The line connecting between seven and seven is about three two. Right. The cooperate cooperate has the sum of zero. Uh. This one. Yeah. So if you change the number. You know, what I'm saying is you don't get C C. You don't get C C. You get you get C D C. Half of D C, perhaps plus half of C D. Half. That Pareto dominates this. Ah, okay. But I don't I don't understand like why what you're telling us change if I change this number. In this analysis, I haven't looked into it. I I don't know. I. I You mean the game with this epsilon automata? That's what I couldn't figure out. Yeah. I I was just trying. I was just trying to show what you could get. You get lots of equilibria. That was the only thing I wanted to say here. I, I had no, nothing more to say on this. Well, I think he's asking yeah. about the Hellman cave uh, uh, That I don't know. Interesting question. I, I don't know. Uh, good question. I don't know. I don't know what you get. I don't think you'll get this pattern in all my case first. In, in that. It, it does depend on the number. I mean, this makes a big difference. You know? when, you, when you make C, CC no longer Pareto optimal, yeah. Yeah, then, then you're making a big quantitative difference. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Why do you think at all that this will lead to Pareto optimal? I mean, what's your what's your basic impression? Where does it come from? Um, I think that uh, when when the players, uh, I don't know. What we want to know is different selections induce different equilibria. 
So we were just looking at the selections that lead to Pareto optimality. The basic idea is that with things like uh, bounded uh, uh, recall or automata, uh, there is this initial phase where it's fairly cheap talk, you're not doing anything, but there is this phase where you're communicating and trying to get a good outcome for yourself. And then there is this final phase where you're sort of in a survival mode where so it would seem reasonable that you would not get into a thing that's just mutually destructive. It's not, it's not clear. Hello? Yeah. Uh, in the paper with Saran, you perturbed by, uh, not, not by bounded recall automata, but by automata. You don't get the result. You know, even yeah. in common interest games, you don't get the result. So I, I think, uh, um, are, are you hoping for a result with general automata over here, or, or with? Of course, that's different. You're not perturbing. Yeah. Yes. You're not well, perturbing. Some intuition that that indicates, or, or, or is it just a prayer? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the original thing was to study what selections lead to what outcomes, just to try to get a handle on this, and to see if, in particular, what selections lead to the optimal outcomes. You have some some intuition why it should lead to Pareto it really depends on these forward induction kind of stories. That's, uh, that's the only answer I have. So, so. Okay. Yeah, just, just an intuition, you didn't know. Ah, okay. Then we have the last question over there. Yes, we have a repeat game with CS. Maybe Nina, who is a donator who speaks science, Nina, who is the next here, the game. So, since you are pushed with the selection, I don't know. I, I, it's a finite selection, so it's a finite game, but I don't know what the asymptotic properties are. Where else? Where else would you be for this conference? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Most the way. So